Hi, today's read aloud is called Cheyenne Again. It's also by Eve Bunting. And as I read, I'd like you to listen like a writer and see what you can notice that the author did, what choices the author made in her writing to really bring the story to life like a movie. Now, this one, you're going to also have to use your inference because it's a historic fiction, which means it's set in the past. And you're going to have to think about what you know about the times when Native Americans were living on in the United States in great numbers, um, sort of before people took over their lands or during that time. Cheyenne again by Eve Bunting, illustrated by Irving Toddy. Again, I'm not gonna show you all the pictures because I'd like you to imagine um, the, the scenery and the setting from the description that Eve Bunting gives us. Of course, when someone writes a book with pictures, they don't always give us the whole description. So see what you can see or hear like a movie and what you can't. One day he comes, the man who counts. Nice hook, huh? Who's he? And says, a boy, age 10, he has to go. This part of the writing where they put it in quotation marks and they say exactly the words that someone spoke is called dialogue. And I've mentioned to many of you that I'd love to see some dialogue in your story. It really brings it to life when you can hear what people say. And you don't want to put in like everything everybody says because then that's too much. You have to kind of pick and choose the parts that tell the story. And when he comes again, he has with him the tall policeman in his white man's clothes, the one called talking man. He wears the hat and spurs, the gleaming silver badge that mark his work. Why would they take a child? What do you know about the treatment of Native Americans in the past? What clues do you have from the text and the pictures? What can you infer? How does the family look about losing their son? Do they seem happy about it? He's shaking the man's hand. The man on the horse, you might notice some things about him. And you just start to ask yourself these questions like, what's going on? What do I know about Native Americans? Why would they be taking a child? What do you infer or guess? Run, run fast, my mother tells me. Hide. Hmm. Again, what is this telling us about a mother? Why would a mother say run and hide? Go ahead, answer. Why would a mother say that? Do you think your mother would tell you to run and hide? Let's see what the father says. But no, my father says, young bull must leave. Now is the white man's world. He needs to learn the white man's ways. The corn is drying out. There will be food in this place they call school. Young bull must go. Hmm. Why does it matter that there's food at the school? What can you infer from that? Maybe you said you thought the mother didn't want him to go because she loved him so much she didn't want to lose her child. But the father sees that there aren't really great options for Native Americans back in those days because the white man was taking over all the land and the future was going to be knowing some things like English. Um, so he was just being practical. Um, the fact that there was food at the school, I mean, to me, that makes me think, and maybe you already guessed this, that they didn't have enough food to eat. I think that they put the Indians on reservations where they couldn't grow enough food, the Native Americans. And they were used to living in certain ways and they wouldn't let them live like that. And so they walk me to the train, the man who counts and taking man. You will speak English, says taking man. It will be better so. He shines his shining badge. I do not want to be like him. Hmm. Interesting, that's showing us a little inner thought. This is the sleeping room, they tell me at the school. So bare a place, the beds in rows, no huddle of my brothers warm around, no smell of smoke, no robe spread on the ground. I will be lonely here. She has a very quiet voice. They take away my buckskins and my shirt, the deerskin moccasins my mother made. They cut my braids, give me a uniform of scratchy wool, the color of an ashen sky with buttons to the neck. No more Cheyenne, they say. You have lost nothing of value. You will be like us. And look at the clues you can have. Look at this little boy's face. Does he look very happy? Hmm. Why would they be changing these children so much? 
I learned geography, arithmetic, and writing in the English tongue, the history of their United States. Hmm. I look, but in the book, I cannot see the victory of Greasy Grass, where General Custer and his men attacked our brave Cheyenne and Sioux. It does not tell how we defeated them and counted coup and left the dead asleep beside the river there. My people speak of this with so much pride, the book leaves it unsaid. What is the author saying about the history taught at the school? One of the things we want to always be asking is, who wrote this and why did they write it? And what is their opinion? Because you're going to find a lot of things written that you agree with and a lot of things written that maybe you don't agree with or don't even believe. And one of the things you have to be is you have to be careful about the things you read and evaluating them to see if it's something that you should trust, a source you should trust. I think in this case, the author obviously has read about history and feels that history only shows the story from one side, from the white men who wrote the history side, and it doesn't really tell the story from the Native American side so often. I think in school we're doing a better job now of telling both sides of the story and, and asking ourselves, who does history, who, who does the story of history represent, who wrote it, and whose stories are not represented? Attend your lessons. Do not sit and dream, the teacher says. You want to be a dumb Indian all your life? I'm sorry, but that's just rude. I toss my head. There's a lot of prejudice. Oh, he tosses his head. Do you, can you see him doing that? Defiant. Don't think he's liking the school. The bugle calls us to dinner and to work. There's carpentry, so we who lived in teepees can repair the wooden buildings where we sleep and shed our tears. We drill like soldiers and we march to keep us out of mischief, so they say. Boy, it doesn't sound like a very happy school. Maybe some of you think school's like that. I hope not. We march in boots that hurt our feet, so used to softness. Go to church, learn of the white man's God and of his love. We never speak Cheyenne or talk of the great spirit, the one who raised us in this land. The Indian us must disappear, they say. It must be tamed. Hmm. What do you think about that? At night, I hear the train, I hear the rain and cry for home. One time, the time of the cold moon, I run away. Hmm, building tension, right? We're feeling a little tense, a little worried about him. The snow is deep. Oh, we're feeling more worried. I have no horse, no food to take with me. <gasps> The tension is rising. I think we're getting close to the heart of the story. Let's see if the action slows way down. I only have the stone my mother gave me once, a stone that wears the scar of wind and rain and still is strong. I hold it fast to give me strength. A blizzard roars across the plain and catches me so I can run no more. He's not very far from the school, is he? The trackers find me there and bring me back. The school will pay $5 cash for any runaway. Hmm. They lock a ball and chain around my ankle. I don't know if you've ever heard grown-ups joke about the old ball and chain. Some people, men will say that their wives are a ball and chain. And they're kind of joking, but this is where the joke came from, is that they used to do this to people to keep them from running. We must have discipline, they say. Do you think schools have too much discipline still? What's your opinion? There is one teacher here I like. Our world is changing fast, she says. We all must change. And if you look at this teacher, what do you think about her? To me, she looks like she might be Native American herself. I think you will be glad someday of what you've learned, though it was hard. She gives me salve, which is, uh, well, ask yourself, what is salve? What does that word mean? Let's see in the sentence. She gives me salve to soothe the place the chain has rubbed. And look at the clues of his ankle. What do you think salve is? I'm looking up here. Did you say maybe some lotion or some medicine? Good guess. Never forget that you are Indian inside. Don't let us take your memories. I draw on paper that is lined, torn from my ledger book across the page. Two warriors ride on painted ponies. One wears a bonnet with full tail. His yellow leggings have bright green fringe. His breech cloths red. The other has a shield with yellow bands. I saw them once like this against a Cheyenne sky. 
Do you ever doodle drawings from your imagination? Nobody can take that from you, can they? The lines across the page are thin and straight as fencing. I snip the wire and thrust through. And in my mind, the warriors and I ride side by side across the golden plain, Cheyenne again. Did he really escape? Or what, what do you think they mean there where he snipped the wires? Did you guess that maybe they're just saying that he, he sort of goes into his imagination? Afterward, in the late 1880s, there were 25 off-reservation Indian boarding schools across the United States. Indian children were often forced to attend these schools, even against the wishes of their parents. The first school to be established was Carlisle in Pennsylvania under the leadership of Captain Richard Henry Pratt. It mo its motto was from savagery into civilization, and its goal was to separate Indian children from their backgrounds and cultures and make them more like white people. Among other school boarding schools was Chamawa in Oregon. Can you believe this happened in our state? Chilico in Oklahoma, Genoa in Nebraska, Haskell in Kansas, they all had the same goals. Boarding schools for Native American children still exist, but they're now more sensitive to the young people's needs and encourage them to treasure the skills and take pride in their heritage. Why do you think it's important to learn about history from multiple perspectives? Cheyenne again. If this book made you curious about that boarding school, you could look it up. I'll bet there's a website to read about Chemawa. So it's C-H-E-M-A-W-A -A in Oregon, Chemawa Boarding School. All right, that's it for today, kids. I hope you enjoyed reading that book. Go read a book of your own.